Hey guys, welcome back to Young Americans Abroad, your best place for weekly content on young American soccer players playing overseas. My name is Austin Van Churn. And my name is Patrick Ferry. And as always, guys, welcome to our show. So guys, we're back with another great episode this week, including and some interesting transfer rumors for one American star who will be featuring at the U20 World Cup. And also another American player in the championship laying it out on the pitch as his team hopes to get into the Premier League. That's right. And we also saw a fond farewell for one player um, playing his last home game this past weekend. All that and more in this episode. So to start our episode today, there's only one player we have to start our episode with, and that would be Christian Pulisic, who played his final home game for Dortmund this weekend in their great 3-2 win, which was uh, you know, greatly due to the fact that Christian scored in this game and was actually man of the match. So um, you know, Christian played 90 minutes and, like I said, scored Dortmund's first goal off a nice uh, header off a cross where he kind of collided with the goalkeeper after it. And, you know, it was just so fitting, Pat, to see him really turn on, you know, his performances at the, end of the, at the end of the season here, where Dortmund really need, you know, points to keep close with Bayern to have a shot going into the final week. And, and Pulisic was able to supply Dortmund with, you know, a big goal yet again in this game. That's right, Austin. I don't want to, you know, make it a storybook ending or, you know, the perfect ending here. But with, uh, you know, a lot of scenarios need to go right for Dortmund to, uh, you know, win the title. But the way, like you said, Pulisic's been playing, scoring, really making an impact. And you can just see it taking to another level as he finishes out his career, which he started, you know, early on in Dortmund, rising through the academies. It, just, it, it seems like it's really come to, coming together for a, like a happy ending. So that, that's awesome to see. Yeah, yeah, this game was just like last week's game. He was, you know, very active all game. He was he picked his moments yet again. He was very smart when he was on the ball. He he didn't try to force things too much, but he was also, you know, the key playmaker, I would say, for Dortmund on the day. And like I said, he was man of the match in this game because he was the difference maker. So, you know, great to see. Obviously, there's only one game left for for Dortmund now and Christian Pulisic. And we'll see if he starts this last game. I know Marco Royce will be back. So with with the way Pulisic's been playing, I think it would be very hard to push him out of that starting lineup. Um, I know Jaden Sancho has been, I believe, injured, or at least he hasn't played um, or started the last two matches for Dortmund. So maybe they'll keep Sancho on the bench if he's not ready to go and and start Pulisic and and Royce. But I kind of think that Lucien Favre will... We'll definitely try to get Pulisic back in this this starting lineup for the final game, Pat, because it's a big one. (laughs) Yeah, it it absolutely is a big one. And it's great to see, you know, especially after that, you know, disaster game against Bayern, uh, you know, a little while back, uh, uh, that they're really still in this and they can really, they still have a shot. And like you said, I think it'll be, it'll give the manager here such a headache because Pulisic's been performing so well um, that how could you leave him off at this time? I think that'd be pretty foolish, uh, you know, in in our opinions here. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And and like I said, you know, Dortmund have a very, very big game this weekend um, against Gladbach. So to win the Bundesliga title, which didn't seem plausible a few weeks ago after that big Bayern loss. But hey, we're still, uh, you know, Dortmund are still in it right down to the final game. But they'll need to beat Gladbach and then also have Bayern lose or, or draw to Frankfurt. But then uh, Dortmund would have to win by a crazy goal differential amount. Oh, so pretty uh, much Bayern needs to lose, I, I assume. Pretty much. Yep. Okay. And, you know, Frankfurt's a very good team. I believe yeah. they're in fifth at the moment. Um, I know they just lost this weekend to Mines. Yeah, so. and they had a rough uh, Europa League exit as well, Austin. Yeah, true. But they, they put up a good fight against they Chelsea. Did. They really did. That was heartbreaking. I was, I was pulling for them. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they're a very good team, and, and I think they'll give Bayern a run for their money. I believe that game is at Bayern. So, you know, they will be definite underdogs. But Dortmund will, you know, be taking on Gladbach, and, you know, Gladbach's a very good team as well. So, um, you know, this is what you want, finally, in the Bundesliga. We finally have a, a title race go down to the last games. And, um, you know, 
two really good games this weekend. Yeah, it's awesome. Now, uh, this has been the clock. year, best year of uh, soccer so far. So, and uh, with with this title yeah. race, like okay. you said, the Bundesliga being so close, um, it'd be so fitting again just to see uh, Pulisic end his time there with that uh, elusive Bundesliga oh. title. That would be oh, it would be fantastic to see to see him lifting that trophy and also you know going on the parade. I, I would hope he'd oh, stay. Oh yeah. Your- that and not i'd love to see your live reaction (laughs) yeah (laughs) but um yeah you know just to touch on it a little bit more or you know one final time here this was his final home game for dortmund and right before the game they had a really nice tribute to him where they gave him like a plaque with a picture and his name and um also some flowers and i believe like a little gift and you know he basically spoke to the dortmund fans one last time and you know thanked them for their support in german yeah, in German. Yeah, perfect German too. I heard some of it. And uh, yeah, you know, just said it was it was the best five years of his life so far, which, you know, he's only been alive for 20 years. But, uh, you know, I think uh, I think he's he's fair in saying that, you know, it was definitely a very influential time in his in his life, and his career. You know, you don't have to hear me saying that you can all see it. But um, yeah, just really exciting to see that. You know, I think we put out an Instagram post, Pat, Sunday night that got a lot of, you know, appreciation. And it was basically our appreciation for uh, Christian Pulisic, you know, just kind of laying it all on the table, um, you know, truly appreciating what he did at Dortmund. You know, he made his uh, appearance when he was 17, um, you know, for what I said was a top 20 team in the world at that time. Um, now has over 100 appearances for Dortmund, you know, uh is now going to Chelsea on a $73 million move, which is fantastic. Also won, you know, the DFB Pokal at Dortmund, and that's all before his 21st birthday. So that's uh, some pretty special stuff, Pat. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's unbelievable. Just, uh, you know, everything you just kind of put in the perspective. It's so hard to, again, put in the words of how much he's, you know, I could go on and on, but we both said it, how he's really transformed the landscape. And you see all these these kids and young kids getting very, excited and going abroad into Europe. He kind of started this trend and almost really helped us uh, with this show. So, uh, you know, all gratitude <laughs> to him. And again, just the U.S. soccer landscape as a whole, even after such a horrible time with um, you know, not qualifying for the World Cup, but rising above it and, you know, playing through some some injuries and out of the lineup here. But really just um, his culmination of all the years at Dortmund hard work is kind of embodies the, the American way there. Yeah. And it's cool to see Dortmund fans appreciate him as well. And, you know, just the – the management of Dortmund were the two play, uh, people giving Christian the uh, the gifts right before the game. So, you know, just it, it's really cool to see that a young American player who's, like I said, not even 21 yet, has made that much of an impact on people at Dortmund. And, you know, Dortmund being one of the best clubs in the world, um, I think that's a fact. I don't think it's my opinion. <laughs> um, it's, it's really cool to see that. So, uh, yeah, definitely an inspiration. And we can't wait to keep watching Christian, you know, at Chelsea. Now it's, uh, I guess, time to even, you know, ex- extend or expand on that, you know, good start to his career. That's right, Austin. There'll be uh, many more uh, interesting takes to come for Christian uh, in the Premier League. Oh, yeah. We'll get a lot of eyes on him, too, which will be, uh, which will be cool. So, uh, yeah, so that's all for Christian. Um, you know, like we said, one more game. We can't wait to talk about him next week. We hope he has a, a big big hand in Dortmund's key victory and Bundesliga title. So I uh, don't want to jinx him here. Knock on wood a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, now let's shift over to England and talk about a player who did all he could to help his team this weekend, Pat. And who would that be? That's right, Austin. Put it uh, perfectly there. And that is uh, Dwayne Holmes uh, for Derby County. I just want to highlight he played set, started and played 70 minutes uh, and an unfortunate 1-0 loss uh, to Leeds uh, United in the first leg. Um, for that push for promotion uh, into the elusive Premier League, uh, you could say. So uh, these games are always really exciting, in my opinion, just because uh, the championship is almost like a a black hole of leagues. Once you go down or you're you're in it, it's really hard to get to that spot with all those teams and tons of league games. Um, So it's, it's nice to see that an American is part of that shift and Dwayne really made an impact in this game, even though the team, Austin, uh, wasn't, you know, finishing in the final third or didn't have that final product. Um, a lot of the fans, Austin, were saying even Leeds alone, uh, 
we're saying, wow, this Dwayne Holmes is a threat. We got to lock him down for the second leg. He's been cutting up our, uh, you know, midfielders and getting, you know, through the defense. But again, the final product wasn't there. But yeah, every everything was good, Austin. Everything was good. Yeah, that's that's promising. You know, there is only, uh, you know, one nil win for Leeds. So Derby definitely have a have a shot in the second leg, even though it's away. But um, yeah, that's really interesting that you know Leeds fans were really admiring uh, Dwayne's game and also you know a little nervous about him as well. That's a pretty yeah. cool, uh, cool thing. Yeah, it is. It is really neat because it's funny. You never really think about uh, other teams admiring other players, or it's you know once we're doing some more research and diving into. Uh, Dwayne's, uh, you know, impact here that uh, the respect that the fans have for, you know, just quality football players, regardless of what team they're on is, you know, says a lot, especially we've been seeing that praise from not even um, obviously the own, their own fans at Derby, but also the manager uh, Lampard to other managers and other teams, which is great to hear about an American. And, um, you know, I hope he doesn't get overlooked and he keeps this path. And Austin, I want to talk about, we were talking a little bit off camera too, the only concern I have is his injuries. I know that's been kind of a concern and problem uh, through him throughout the year. Yeah, yeah, he has missed some times with injuries, um, and it has kind of been an issue with him in the past. I believe at at Scunthorpe when he was there, he had some injuries as well. Um, I, I, there was a club before that too. I can't remember his uh, his career because there's been a lot, a few clubs <laughs> yeah, in his yeah. past. <laughs> but I think that was one of the knocks on him was he got injured a little too much. And, you know, that kind of makes sense. He's a player who's who's very creative and likes to, to dribble at players. And, um, you know, he's a player that is a, an impact maker. And players will will see that and kind of try to, to rattle him a little bit by fouling him hard. And I think he kind of falls victim to some of those, uh, you know, rash challenges from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Really good point, too, and just to highlight as well, just for this season, Austin, in the championship, which alone, again, I have to look up, uh, maybe you guys know, or Austin, maybe you know off the top of your head, how many games, uh, league games they play in the championship? I think it's like 30 plus. Yeah. Uh, 35 yeah, plus, maybe? I don't know. I think it's in the 40s. It might be 40s, yeah, but a ridiculous amount of the games, and he's only played 1,500 minutes uh, in league play, which oh, really? okay. isn't as high as you, you want to be. I, mean, I know we've talked about on the show, he had, uh, I think it was some thigh problems a few weeks ago, um, some other nagging, uh, you know, leg injuries. But I get, and he's been, once he recovers from those, it's just kind of in and out, maybe his 20, 30 minute substitute impact. And then once he gets rolling again, just starting and dominating, uh, puts together a few, four or five good performances, and then maybe some kind of injury setback. So we really hope that he can kind of, you know, he's finished, you know, finish off the season strong and get to the Premier League, Austin. But, I mean, yeah, we just can really hope that he kind of, I guess, takes care of himself and makes sure that he's fully fit and can stay healthy for a full year because I think he'd be unbelievably dangerous and hard to ignore uh, for a U.S. Uh, prospect. Yeah, yeah, and I think some of the reason why maybe he didn't play so many minutes this year is that he it took a little while for him to break into the Derby first team there. It seemed like... To start the year, we we heard that he moved to Derby, but we weren't really, you know, too, um, I guess, sure of what type of player and what type of path they had for him at Derby. Um, so he wasn't really in those first team plans when, when we think about it, Pat. I, I don't think we really thought Dwayne was going to play much at the beginning of the year. Not at all. That's actually a really good point, Austin, going back, because moving from Scunthorpe to Derby, that's a, that's a whole nother level. That's a... Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big deal, Austin. And again, with, that's a big transition, different different league and um, new manager, or exactly. at least a manager somewhat new. I, I I can't remember if this is his, if this is Frank Lampard's first year at Derby or not. It feels like it is. I, I feel like it but, is. It's either his first or second. I'm almost positive you're right, and it's his first. Um, that's even harder too to be managed by a legend. Uh, yeah, got to respect <laughs> the guy. Uh, Very true. <laughs> And but, Frank said a lot of good things about him this year, too. Yeah, so. he has. And it seems like he just really – because when you watch him play, and we've seen some of the highlights and stuff, he really brings an element to the game where he's really, really fast. You can see a whole other gear that he has compared to the other players. He is – when he is on form, he is bossing through – you know, we've seen some great runs and balls where he goes through two or three people. Um, so you can see his qualities there. Maybe it's just kind of uh, getting the tactics and the speed uh, up to speed and uh, being maybe uh, synchronized with his teammates there. Yeah, and consistent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, consistency there. But so we, you can kind of see some of those elements. And uh, again, I think this is an exciting way to end the season. 
Um, and I, we hope we can pull it off uh, away there and make a huge impact. And uh, we can highlight that performance next week as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, props. Up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was but, gonna uh, say it's okay. not the end of the world if he doesn't um or if Derby don't get promoted, but you know, it would be it would be cool to see um you know another player, uh, another American player in the Premier League next year and another player who's been a big focal point of Derby down the down the line. Yeah, that that'd be awesome. Awesome, awesome Austin. <laughs> it's a tongue twister there. But uh yeah, we'll keep uh Keep an eye on Dwayne, and guys, just want to mention too, the game is Wednesday, uh, the second leg. So any stream you can find uh, should be an exciting, uh, you know, battle to the end. Very physical match there. Yeah, and it should be on ESPN Plus, or at least the the first leg. I'm pretty sure it was. So um, yeah, if you have ESPN Plus, you know, you can always watch. We, we think Dwayne will start just because he started the first leg and looked pretty dangerous. You know, he was flying all around the field. But um, yeah, <laughs> just wanted to cut That's in it. real quick. No, yeah, so stay tuned. But uh, also, I know uh, we want to shift back uh, to Germany and the Bundesliga for one of the players at uh, Schalke America. <laughs> That's right. And that would be Wes McKinney, who actually started, played 90 minutes in Schalke's 1-1 uh, draw with Leverkusen. And this game for Weston was a little bit tumultuous, at least to start. So in the first half, you know, Weston played yet again as a right center back. So, um, you know, a position he's not super familiar with, but is getting, has gotten more game time at that position recently. And unfortunately, he actually uh, tried to clear a ball that also led to Leverkusen's first goal. And basically, it was a, a ball that he cleared directly to the foot of Kai Havertz in the box, who then finished the, the ball right out of uh, midair. Um, Ooh, was that an assist? Ugh. Essentially. It was... <laughs> it was a pretty good assist to be honest but uh so that was not very good for Weston but it was something that was you know he couldn't really control he just tried to head the ball upfield didn't get you know all of the ball and it kind of you know fall to the left um kind of perfectly to to deliver uh Kai Havertz and Leverkusen so um you know that that helped Leverkusen go up one nil um but then Schalke battled back and actually got a goal back later on in the game and Weston really played better after that little moment. Um, you know, it wasn't a fantastic game, but he was pretty solid, you know, all game and actually was involved in a penalty. So it was basically a play where there was a corner. Weston was going up for the header. I believe he got sandwiched in between um, Kevin Volland on, uh, from Leverkusen and another one of their players. And basically Volland kind of elbowed or put his arm into Weston's head. And in live time, it didn't really look like a penalty and play kind of resumed. But once there was a dead ball, they went back and looked at it with VAR. And the referee that day uh, made the decision that it was a penalty. So, uh, you know, Weston, I guess, earned a penalty for his club. But unfortunately, the penalty was saved. Um, and it was Daniel Caligiri who, who took the penalty and was saved by Leverkusen. So, um, you know, there was really nothing that came of it. But it was, just, you know, still, I guess, a pretty good play or, you know, a pretty good thing that happened that Weston was involved in where, um, you know, he got a penalty and an interest. Yeah. Almost little. a redemption, Austin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It could have been, and it could have been for the, the game winner too, but just wasn't meant to be Pat. So, um, you know, Schalke, I, th I think getting one point away uh, or, you know, in a game against Leverkusen, who's been playing very well recently, that's, that's a good result for them. And I think they'll take it. So, you know, I think Schalke are just trying to get through, the rest of the season at this point and kind of move on to next year. But yeah, it seems just like a, a weird limbo spot there. And it's just like, all right, let's hit the reset button. Yeah. And, and, you know, we only have one more game or they only have one more game left. So um, yeah, but uh, you know, Weston, like I said before, was a center back yet again this week. Hopefully we don't, we, we, we see that maybe one more time this year and then we don't see that <laughs> really ever again. But uh Yeah. So that's it from uh, from Schalke, Schalke America this season or, or this uh, episode. So let's move on to uh, the Premier League, Pat. And let's talk, I guess, briefly about a player who unfortunately went through uh, some surgery this week. Yeah, Austin, some concerning news for uh, Newcastle United's defender, uh, DeAndre Yedlin here. Um, so he actually hadn't played since, I think it was April 6th, uh, where he was involved in a horrible incident where he gave up a con conceded a penalty, uh, pretty brutal uh 
tackle there, which he completely missed. Um, so that was that was rough, and then he was kind of out of the lineup. But then right before the uh, the Liverpool game, um, Austin, he I guess uh, was reported with a little groin problem, and we didn't really hear too much about it until you know maybe a little bit after. And Yedlin posted an Instagram picture, and rumors were swirling that he was in uh, Philadelphia for some surgery uh, on his groin. So that's a little concerning, especially uh, with the timetable of the Gold Cup, Austin. So uh, I want to get yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, it was definitely something that flew under the radar, something that we weren't really aware of until, like you said, uh, DeAndre posted it right on his Instagram. Um, so, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, disappointing to hear that. And, yeah, it doesn't seem like he's going to be ready for the Gold Cup. So I think this is a big opportunity that's missed for him just because now he's kind of in a battle with, I guess you would say, Nick Lima for – if 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 Yedlin is good for that, you know, Greg Berhalter right back role or not. So it'll look like, you know, Yedlin won't even have a shot to kind of prove that he can play that role at the Gold Cup this summer. So that's yeah. that's kind of a bummer for him. Exactly. I just want to quickly touch on that that too, because you made a really good point because there were some rumors of Berhalter's system and stuff, a lot of debate in soccer, uh, the Twitter sphere and things like that, and just uh, soccer analysts and stuff were saying that Yedlin might not even fit the role or might not even be that, that first choice starter. And the fact that this injury came at this unfortunate time uh, really, like you said, hurts his chances there um, because then we have other opportunities for other great players, but uh, Yedlin could be kind of on the outside looking in. Yeah. And I think he will be, to be completely honest. Um, you know, it's, we don't really know if he would have been that first choice right back if he was called in to, to camp for this summer um or not but you know without him making that list then i you'd have to think probably nick lima would get that the, the shot at the job because greg really likes what he sees from him so yeah i think that's a pretty good prediction there and uh i honestly i think nick lima has performed very well in that role um, for the small sample size we have so uh could be a great opportunity yeah. for him as well but it could also be tyler adams now i'm thinking about it yeah <laughs> could yeah. be him I'm, I'm still not sold on him being that right back uh, I don't want him to. I guess that's maybe why I blocked it out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, I I just feel like we're we're really stunting his strengths, putting yeah, him as that. I think we're wasting that. Yeah. So sorry, maybe that is the right back choice for the Gold Cup, but I, <laughs> I'm not really sold on that yet. Right. I don't know. We'll see. We're we're going to be dominating possession and and all the games that we play. Hopefully this summer. That's a good point. So maybe yeah, at least in the group stage. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to think. <laughs> Although you know Trinidad and Tobago, man, they're uh, they're a powerful force, not That's to be reckoned right. with. They're uh, they're in our minds. They're messing with our minds, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like you said, Pat, not great for Yedlin, and could be a, a injury that has longer lasting effects than just you know the uh, the amount of time he'll be sidelined for. That's a good point, Austin. And then um, I know one final uh, you know we want to touch on here, those interesting transfer rumors for one of our uh, you know players that were, was on loan uh, in uh, Scotland there. Yeah, and that would be Tim Wayo. So right now, you know, Tim will be meeting up with the U20s for the World Cup or the U20 World Cup that will be coming up here in the next week or so. So there has been a lot of rumors flying on Twitter, and we thought we should just, you know, talk about a few of them. Because I know we have talked in the past about some rumors with Tim, but there's some new teams that have been attached to him at the moment. And I guess the first team would be Stade de Rennes um, over in France, Pat. And that's also the same team that Jordan Sabichu, uh plays for, another player who we covered last year but haven't really um, took to covering this year just because it seems like he probably won't be playing for the U.S. anytime soon. But, Pat, what do you think about that, that Ren rumor? Do you think that would be a good team for, for Tim? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, we can, we'll can we cover the other teams as well, but I think Rennes uh, would be an interesting move. They also uh, won that uh, the French Cup, which is exciting, uh, upside yeah. PSG, which is great. But um, I think, yeah, we were touching on it uh, off camera a little bit. It would definitely be a place where he'd be surrounded by pretty quality players, and he'd have to kind of step up that level, especially from Celtic, um, and really challenge himself and be that guy who wants to be a you know a consistent starter. And it's great to be learning at PSG and sitting on the sidelines a little bit with Neymar and you know Cavani and all those top players. But it's another thing to be that first one, uh, the guy, the first one on the team sheet, I guess you could say. And I think that would be a great place 
um, for him to go, especially with them uh, being kind of, you know, upper, I guess you could kind of put them in that kind of upper echelon of French teams, uh, in your opinion, what do you think? Yeah, I would say Ren will probably be, like you have what, like PSG, who's, you know, top yeah. of the top. You have kind of like Lyon, Marseille, uh, nice even I would maybe throw in there. Lil this year who've been playing really well. Yeah. Would you have them right under that? Yeah, I would say Ren would probably be one of those teams right under that. Um, maybe with like Montpellier. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're a team that has a lot of talent. Um, you know, one attacker that's one of the better players in Ligue would be Ismail Asar, who is on Ren at the moment. And I think, you know, it, it would going to Ren for Tim Way would definitely be like a, a a good stepping stone. I think it would be a very um, bold stepping stone. I don't think he would earn starting minutes right away just based on the players that they have. So it would definitely be a place where he'd have to really challenge himself and prove to the coach that, you know, he deserves getting minutes. Cause I believe even Jordan Sabachu, who's, you know, a striker and not so much a winger had some times getting, getting game time or had some trouble getting game time earlier this year. So, um, you yeah, know, that, that shows a lot, of Austin, because he was a pretty quality player, scoring some good goals. Yeah, and he did score goals when he got called upon this year. So, um, you know, maybe it shows that the manager is willing to play, you know, a player, if, even if he's on the fringe um, in some games. But, you know, we definitely don't want a, another situation that occurred kind of later on at Celtic for Tim. And it could have been a lot worse than it was, but it just seemed like Tim got frozen out at, at the end of that uh, Celtic loan. Yeah, and that, that was a little concerning. You, you definitely don't want to see that, especially at this crucial age. And also, I know um, some of the other clubs, too, were uh, Crystal Palace and I think uh, Strasbourg, another French team. So what, what were your takes, I guess, on that? Would you, would you like to see Tim in the Premier League or would you like to see him at Strasbourg uh, or would Ren be the best place? Um, yeah, so I, I don't really want to see him in the Premier League right now. I just don't think that would be the best place for him to grow. And I think, Pat, you agree with me as well. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm definitely uh, on that take, especially with Zaha and uh, Crystal Palace are some strong, pretty, fairly strong players, and you don't want to be sucked into that. Uh, I always call it kind of like the the black hole of the uh, um, the bottom teams of the Premier League that are really fighting for survival because there's some big TV money on the line, and uh, they don't want to maybe mess around with some of the younger players coming in. So yeah, yeah, very true. So so Crystal Palace is kind of out in my <laughs> opinion. I I mean it would be a Great move to the Premier League, but I think it's just a little too early for Tim. Um, Strasbourg is another really interesting team. They finished in 11th in Ligue 1 this year, or at least are sitting in 11th right now. I can't can't remember if Ligue 1 is finished or not. But um, they finished right ahead of Stade Ren, who uh, Stade de Ren, who was in 12th. So it's a team that you know is kind of in that same category as Ren. I don't think they have nearly as many established players, but they're a team that. I think would give Tim an opportunity to play minutes right away. And I think, you know, being in Ligue 1, that would definitely help his rep over in France. So I, I kind of like Strasbourg a little bit more than Ren. I do think Ren could be a good option for Tim, um, but the, it could become, you know, a place where he doesn't play at a lot easier than I think Strasbourg would be. Um, you know, another club that I'll just flip out their pad as well that I saw today on Twitter was Dusseldorf over in the Bundesliga. So, you know, we've seen a lot of Americans go to Germany and have success. So maybe Tim could kind of follow in that, uh, you know, that, that line, follow in those footsteps of those players and 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 play for Dusseldorf. Um, you know, Dusseldorf have had their moments this year. They've played really well at times, and then they've played really bad at other times. Yeah, they have um, been really, um, I guess, what's the word, almost on a roller coaster uh, ride there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're a team that, turn it on some games and look unstoppable. And then other games, they look like, you know, a team that's getting relegated. Um, and they have a lot of attacking talent, a lot of young attacking talent. So Tim could definitely kind of fit into that, that mold that they have at the club and be one of the players that kind of gets minutes for them. Um, you know, I think that would be an inter interesting move. You know, um, I I'm not sure if, if the Bundesliga is the best place for him. I don't think it would be a bad place for him. I think he could – actually hold his own pretty well at a club like Dusseldorf, but I kind of want to see him stay in France, Pat. So I, I would say still Strasbourg or, or Ren. I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you think? I think those are good points too. And I think uh, we're in agreement. So I think Ren would, that would definitely be my top choice. Um, I, 
I mean, I know they're sitting close in the French league and I have to dive a little more deep, deeper in the history of Strasbourg, but I think that Ren seems like, you know, they, they just won a cup. Um, they're usually in the, the, the battles for at least the Europa League spots, uh, typically. Um, and I think that would just be a, a great opportunity, like you said, a league that he's kind of familiar with and comfortable with. Uh, he could really challenge himself. And um, I, I, yeah, I think it's too early for the Premier League. I think the spotlight would be a little bit too big and uh, he could fall behind the bench there, at least at this point in time. And maybe he has a, a few good years, um, you know, at a Strasbourg or um, Rent Ren. Uh, and then kind of goes and takes that next step. But I agree with you. I think the French league is definitely uh, the league for uh, Tim Way there. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about it a little bit more. You know, Ren has some some lineage of producing good attacking talents. Usman Dembele. Um, that's you know, that's like an a, okay player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see Tim Way at Barcelona at some point. <laughs> um but yeah, they also have, like I said, Ismail Sar, who's definitely one of the better young attacking prospects in France at the moment. So I think you'd get some good coaching if you went to Rennes. Um, it would kind of be on him, though, to really make of that loan, you know, what he could. Um, I think that would definitely be a career-defying loan if you went there. So, you know, that's all we can all we can really hope for is him going to a place where he plays and can make an impact. So. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll keep monitoring Tim Wea and see you know what happens after the U20 World Cup this summer, and we can't wait to report on it. So now, guys, we want to move over and talk a little bit about the U20 roster that was just released for the U20 World Cup, and we won't go into great detail about each and every player, but we did want to give um, you know talk about a few of the storylines surrounding this roster, and then also Pat, you know, give a few. Uh, players that we're excited to see that are on this roster and a few storylines we're excited to see. So I guess I'll start off first. And the two – or the storyline and the two players that I was very disappointed not to see on this roster was Jonathan Amon and then also um, Julian Araujo. So those were two players who, in my book, Pat, I think really deserve to be on this roster – um, you know, Eamon's been a consistent performer for Nordjylland over in Denmark for the past, I would say, almost a year, um, and is a very dynamic player. You know, he's also made his first team debut with the, the full men's national team. So he was a player that I really just wanted to see on this roster. Um, I know, Pat, you told me off camera that there were some, like, uh, friction with his club or his club didn't really want to release him. It kind of right. sounded like. Yeah, so that's the interesting point. I think you and the, the rest of us soccer fans are all uh, uh, shocked because I was reading Twitter, like you said, where's where's Araujo, where's uh, where's uh, um, Eamon? So we're not, you know, a little bit disappointed. But uh, going back to that rumor, uh, Nordschland actually must really, you know, think highly, and it's great to see him, uh, them value uh, Eamon at the club and are very reluctant and hesitant to release him, um, whether that's, uh, you know, just because he's been such a crucial part of the team, they want him healthy for the full year. Uh, next year or you know he's had some injuries here and there uh, they don't want to risk that so it's really nice to see that they're they're thinking about him uh you know down the road yeah and you know it sucks to see him miss out on this tournament but like you said pat it just shows that he's in a good spot right now and at a club that really values him and will will we'll play him <laughs> on the field which is i would say the most important thing that comes out of you know this u20 world cup um it's a great tournament to showcase players and um, you know, help them get in good situations at their club, you know, club level at the at the team they're currently at. So, um, yeah, that was a little disappointing. You know, Julian Araujo, I would say, is a little bit more disappointing in my book just because I think he would have been a key player for this team. Um, you know, maybe he wouldn't have started um, at right back, but if there was an injury to Serginho Dest or even an injury to one of the center backs, I thought he could – really fill in and cover, you know, both of those positions and prove to be a very vital substitute. Even if, yeah. you know, someone get, gets a yellow card accumulation, gets an unfortunate red card, I think defense, the you know, the defense at, on this roster is a little bit um, shallow. And I think, you know, having a player like Julian on the roster would have been great cover for, for all those players. I completely agree too, Austin. Was there uh, maybe think something I saw on Twitter that injuries could have played a part? Is that... Uh, well, the reason or is that what, what would you say? Well, you know, it could have been, um, but Julian Araujo started the the game for the the Galaxy this ah, week. Okay, so that is a, so, a squash there. 
Yeah, so either Tab got some faulty, uh, you know, <laughs> advice or some faulty information from the Galaxy, but I wouldn't. I don't think Araujo is like he's perfectly healthy right now, or at least healthy enough to play for the Galaxy, who are in in need of you know, kind of they haven't played very well the last two games, right. so they kind of needed to get a result this weekend. Um, and you know, he started. He was the first. You know, he was on the team sheet, so I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's a very valid point for why he's left off this roster. Yeah, and that, and that uh, baffled me too, because I know again we'll get into death later, but um, he is you know pretty much the only line there. The, the depth, the depth really isn't there. Um, yeah, not at right back. There yeah. is some depth at left back with <laughs> right. Matt Real, but none at right back. So definitely very shocking, Pat. And you know, he's a player that also has Mexican heritage. Could also play for Mexico. So. I think this could be a big. Um, this could become a big issue if he's not kind of, you know, brought up to maybe the U23 team in the future. Some people are saying he might get called up for the Gold Cup preliminary roster. I, I don't really see that happening. I'm not sure where people are getting their their intel or their advice from. But um, you know, in my book, I think he's one of the better players on this team, even though he's a younger player right now. He's only 17, but. From from all the highlights I've seen of him, all the game footage I've seen, I've watched you know a few full games of him right now. Um, he looks the part, and he looks like a very exciting. <laughs> looks like an MLS veteran, Austin. <laughs> he plays like it. <laughs> he he's great. So very disappointing. I hope this doesn't you know um, snowball into him trying to play for Mexico or accepting you know a call up in a in a youth camp somewhere along the way here from Mexico because he is right now playing with Jonathan Dos Santos, another, you know, high profile Mexican national team player. Um, and he had, he doesn't really have too many USMNT players on that galaxy squad. I guess you could say yeah. Joe Corona, but yeah. um, That's a good point. So, so just a little concerning Pat. Um, and I, I think we're going to move on to the next kind of interesting storyline. That's right, Austin. And uh, shifting back to uh, exciting uh, to see him include on this uh, roster here is uh, Timo, our boy Timo Leia. That's um, right. So he has uh, you know, made his presence known in the past uh, for the youth national teams, uh, scoring some incredible bangers and having some really breakout performances um, that almost, you could say, kind of jump-started, uh, really kicked off the club career there for him. Yeah. Um, so it really is interesting to see because he, he could almost be uh, – that veteran presence um, really coming back and having that experience and that maturity and kind of really be almost that, uh, that leader for the young, younger players. But uh, Austin, I, I know um, we were talking off camera too, and uh, I want to touch on what um, Tab Ramos actually said about him kind of, uh, you know, not necessarily having to be that leader, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was, those were some interesting quotes from Tab. Um, you know, I, I agree with him. He basically, what did he say, Pat? Basically, he was saying that, um, you know, Tim will play best when he's in a very loose environment, when he's having fun, fun on the field. So we don't really want to, you know, pressure him with coming in and trying to be that, that sole leader. You know, we have a lot yeah. of guys who can kind of lead on this team. Exactly. And that's... Kind of just do his thing, basically. Yeah, exactly. You just hit the, the nail on the head there. So that's, that's, that's an interesting philosophy. And I, Actually, kind of like that from Tab. Just to you know, these are young players uh, still finding their feet um, professionally with their clubs, and then coming in for a big U uh, twenty World Cup for their country here. Um, not kind of having the weight on their shoulders, um, you know, until maybe they get to the senior team, but also having that that room to again, you don't have this sole focal leader that comes in and everyone kind of you know looks on and piles on for advice, but some of that can just come in, play freely, and maybe even lead by example. And we've seen Tim. He's a very passionate guy. He'll definitely yeah. rile up some of the, the players and fans alike. But it's great to see him kind of come in and get integrated with this group and be like, hey, guys, I've been here before. But um, they all have their, you know, their strengths and the advantages here with such a talented roster. Also, we can go on and on. So it's great to see uh, that Tim uh, will be making a huge impact here. Um, and this could be another, I guess, almost kind of like a, not a re-jump start, but a, another jump uh, to the next pedestal for him. Yeah, and it was cool to hear how much he really wanted to be a part of this U20 team. That's um, right. Because he hasn't made any U20 appearances yet. He's made some full USMNT appearances, and then he made um, two appearances for the U23 team. 
a few months ago. So this was kind of something that it sounded like he really was pushing for. And that's that's just really exciting to me because it makes me or it makes him seem to me like he's someone who has his ear to, you know, U.S. soccer. He's following this U-20 team and he understands, you know, how big of an impact this U-20 World Cup could be and um, how big a USMNT, you know, run in this U-20 World Cup could be for soccer in the country. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's fantastic. Actually, got me really excited there, Allison. That's uh, <laughs> because he actually requested um, to leave Celtic uh, on loan early for that's the right. to get to the like you mentioned to be released early and get ready for the US U twenty World Cup. So that that shows he's really thinking about the you know the US. He's very passionate about um, the country and the program here, as well as thinking about his career and what this could really do for him individually as well. So it seems like he has a great head on the shoulders and he's uh, ready to uh, you know perform at uh, this World Cup. Yeah, I can't wait to see him. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, the next thing we want to talk about a little bit is uh, Brandon Cervania getting called up over Christian Capis. So, you know, Pat, we've been following Christian, uh, you know, for the whole time he's been in Denmark. He's really started to really take to, to life in Denmark, making more and more appearances for Hobro, becoming kind of a, a consistent player in the 18 for them. That's right. And, Manuel Savvy. <laughs> yeah. And he had a good U20 camp, um, I believe in March, the most recent U20 camp. He, I believe, scored in both games in that camp. And if he didn't score in both games, he looked really dangerous in both of those games. And I thought cemented a place in this team. But it looks like, for some reason, Brandon Cervania, who, you know, we, I guess we shouldn't really single out one player that, uh, you know, we wish Capis was called up over. But when you look at that, that, that midfield, there's some some really good players in it. And the one player that kind of stands out who I would say is a little undeserving would be Cervania. Um, and that's just because he hasn't really played for, for FC Dallas this year. He's been more with North Texas SC, which is FC Dallas's USL club, or their I think it's their USL one club, um, which is right. the third tier. But um, yeah, and, and like I said, you know, Christian – played really well and I thought deserved a spot and you know they're similar players Cervania is a little bit more defensive but you already have Chris Durkin and uh, Edwin Cerillo who's another FC Dallas player who's been playing lights out in MLS this year as a defensive midfielder so I just don't really see why we picked Cervania over Capis. Yeah so no, I I'm baffled as well because I mean there must be some kind of connection now with the FC Dallas players there now. <laughs> but um, hey, right, Capis is an FC Dallas player yeah, as well. So. That's true. That's true. But uh, yeah, he's um, and we've covered him uh, a little, a good bits on the uh, the show with Hobro, and uh, they're actually in a you know a fight for uh, um, you know surviving and avoiding relegation. And uh, Capis actually, like you said, has been uh, playing uh, for the first team, uh, starting to get into that starting role and making some good substitute appearances. So he's really kind of breaking in and making an impact uh, at the highest level, uh, you know, there in Denmark for a you know, professional team there. So, um, you know, it really exciting to see. And I mean, I don't know, there, there must be some reason I'm, I'm not too familiar with uh, uh, Strange to be honest, but maybe is there a past connection or some kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe in the past if they've worked together and I know Tab has said he's, it was tough to leave off some players, but he felt he wanted to include some that he was more, familiar with uh for a longer period of time maybe that could be it yeah i mean you do raise a good point i do think tab is a little bit more familiar with Cervania just because Cervania was with him for that Concacaf under 20 championship um and was kind of kind of a key player on that squad um i, I think he did start most of the games in that tournament and, and looked pretty decent but just hasn't really had much success in you know for his club this year starting off the 2019 season. Um, so maybe, like you said, Pat, it's just a, a case of Tab knowing what he has in Cervania a little bit more than he does with Capis. And, you know, maybe, you know, Jonathan Amon had some issues getting released from a team in Denmark. Maybe Christian Capis had some issues getting released from uh, Hobro. That's a, good, uh, that's a good point, too. I didn't even think of that. So yeah, you never know. Yeah, but, you know, Nonetheless, we're talking about bench players who are, um, you know, our biggest qualms at the moment. So that's uh, 
that's actually a pretty good thing. I think this this starting eleven is going to be very strong, and you know I, I'm really excited, Pat. Me you too. And about some of the players we're really excited to that's see. Right, I'm uh, very excited, and I think this could be a huge X factor and uh, someone that could be a, a a great starter and make an impact is uh, Alex Mendez. I think. Uh, He's had a had a great rise and some kind of key performances with the uh, Fabregas. I know you've been following it as well, uh, you know, with the Bund Americans there. But uh, with the U19s, Austin um, putting in some great performances now, and it seems like he could really um, come down the line and make an impact when we need some of those set pieces. And we've seen him score some, uh, you know, long strikes and things like that. So he could be a uh, pivotal man that could, or uh, you know, player that could come in and right at the end of the game where we need one of those uh, <laughs> crazy comparisons, but a Vincent company strike from far out or uh, yeah, right. a great set piece play that the U.S. Uh, has been uh, known for all the way up to the senior team uh, to, to give us that lead. So I think Mendez uh, could be a really uh, good breakout player here. Yeah, he's been really on his game for, for Freiburg's U19s recently. Um, he's really taken a life in Germany. And I, I think a, a first team call up for Freiburg is somewhere in his future. Oh, um, you think so? That's awesome. All right. I, I think in preseason they would have to give him a look the way he's been playing. And I think, you know, if he has a great uh, U20 World Cup, I think that'll be even more um, certain, I think, coming up here uh, uh, later on in the summer. I, I definitely think he's a player who, like you said, has that game changing ability. Um, you know, can score from set pieces pretty much at ease. <laughs> um, yeah. And we haven't really had a player like that at this level. No, and it's it's so exciting to watch him just kind of, again, like you said, make that almost, I want to say, could be a seamless transition, um, you know, to life in Germany and abroad and uh, really rising up quickly. Um, and he could, again, uh, I don't want to reiterate the same points, but if he really puts in a great performance at this World Cup, um, who knows? I think the sky's the limit. Uh, for him in Germany, and who's to say, uh, you know, if he does and when he does break into Freiburg, he could go on to, uh, you know, bigger and better things as well. I think uh, he has a really high ceiling, in my opinion, uh, in terms of his o- offensive ability and playmaking. I think defensively, maybe he needs to get a little uh, better on, but again, yeah. maybe not the most important quality right now is because he excels so well uh, attacking. Yeah, yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. So very exciting, very excited about Alex Mendez. Um, you know, Pat, you brought up a good point, a good player. I'm really excited to see the front trio, um, or at least the trio of wingers of Tim Wea, Conrad De La Fuente, and Uli Yanez. So I don't know if they'll all three play at the same time. I would be very interested to see Tim Wea kind of play as a striker and be flanked by those two other wingers. Oh um, man, that just sounds tantalizing is the word. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot of pace. A lot of oh pace. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but whoever starts on the wings, you know, we think Sebastian Soto will be the starting striker for this team. But um, yeah, just to see Tim Weah, you know, with this group, um, I think it adds such a big dimension to the attack. Um, you know, a player with experience, a player with a lot of pace, um, and a lot of good ideas as well. It's just really exciting. And then you have another player like Conrad De La Fuente, who has a lot of ideas himself, maybe not as fast as Tim Weah, but definitely a player who's very skillful and will not be afraid to take on anyone. And then you have a player like Ulianes, who really lit up the CONCACAF U20 tournament, played very well, You know, has kind of been under the radar just because he hasn't been playing um, to start 2019 since he moved to uh, Wolfsburg, but definitely a player that a lot of people are very excited about. Um, and in the short amount of time we've seen him or the short amount of game film we've seen of him um, looks very impressive. So those are the, you know, the, the attacking trio that I'm really, really looking forward to watch. Yeah. And, and see. Hey, Austin, and just to kind of, uh, you know, uh, throwing the point too, like you said, uh, defensively there's some some areas that are concerned, but offensively this is I almost want to say as much you know hype and excitement uh, behind these players really breaking in uh, through Europe and uh, with their you know youth and academy teams over there that really could deliver you know give us one of the best performances uh, we could see uh, for the U20 group. I think this is one of the highest potentials I think in a while, or maybe I don't even want to say ever that might be too much, but this could really be a you know something special. 
Yeah, and it's the first roster that we've had for U20 World Cup that has not included a college player. So I think that kind of shows that, you know, we've come so far to not even have a single college player on this roster. Um, I think Eric Williamson, last uh, U20 World Cup cycle, was, I believe, the only one from college um, last year. So now we have zero players on the uh, U20 World Cup roster, which I think is a testament to what we've done, um, you know, in America, trying to build the academy system, and then also having all these players, you know, go abroad that we've covered. Um, really helps out a lot and builds the quality of this team. That's right, Austin. Yes, I mean, again, again, like you said, we're so excited to you know keep covering and we'll uh, monitor all these performances. And I hope just because they've uh, done pretty well with Tad the last two uh, uh, times in the U twenty is going to the quarterfinals. So it'd be nice to kind of push that uh, to the next level uh, and yeah. see them really, really compete. And it'd be even fantastic if they get to the World Cup final. At least the semifinal would be great. Yeah. So would you say that the um, the goal would be to reach the semifinal? I think so. I think uh, we've, you know, again, two consecutive times in the quarterfinals. I think it needs to be the next step is the semifinal. And who's to say even that they're setting the goal of let's just get to the World Cup final. I know that's, that's lofty, but with this talent and uh, this talent pool that we've maybe never even had uh, before, uh, there could be a lot of possibilities, like I was saying before, Austin. So I know we're really both excited. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we can't wait. So the first game is on, I believe it's a, a Friday, May 24th, uh, against Ukraine. So definitely one to watch. Um, I believe it's at 2.30 as well. And, yeah, we, we can't wait. You know, Ukraine's going to be a pretty tough opponent. Um, probably the second best team in the tournament. Um, I know they have a really good goalkeeper who's on the books at Real Madrid and was actually on loan in uh, La Liga this year and played – um, some games. So, <laughs> you know, a little concerning, a test, Austin. but yeah, like you said, a great test. So um, yeah. So that's all for our coverage on the U twenties for this episode, but we'll make sure to keep you guys updated in future episodes and yeah. So now let's head over to quick kicks. All right, guys, it's about that time of the show. We got to keep uh, keep the ball rolling here. Um, and this is my favorite time and I know it's yours as well. It's none other than quick kicks. So you could test Dwayne Miller. It's Altidore over the wall, and that one is in. Josie Altidore from a long way out. The opening goal for the United States. So to start quick kicks today, we want to talk about Alex Mendez, who scored a goal in Freiburg U19's unfortunate 3-2 loss to Augsburg U19s. And uh, heading over to Belgium, there, uh, Ethan Horvath started and played a 90 in a crucial 3-2 win against Genk. Uh, which narrowed the uh, the gap in the Belgian playoffs to uh, just three points. And it also means Horvath will be playing in the Champions League playoffs. Nice. That's good news. And uh, Sebastian Soto scored another goal for Hanover's U19s in their 4-1 win this past weekend. Nice, Austin. And uh, heading over to Belgium again, uh, Brendan Heinz eyck for KV Kortrick uh, started and played 90 uh, minutes in a 5 nothing win against Zulte Vargum. Cool. And uh, Blaine Ferry had an assist in Grother Firth 2's 3-1 uh, loss to Byron's uh, U23's. And uh, a player we just talked about a little bit ago, uh, Christian Cappies, was actually the man of the match um, in an unfortunate one nothing loss in the first leg of the relegation playoffs uh, to uh, Valhe. That's unfortunate. And uh, Jonathan Amon played 90 minutes in Norchiland's unfortunate 2 0 loss to Bromley. Few losses there, unfortunately. But uh, heading over to the uh, uh, Premier League uh, for Fulham and Luca De La Torre uh, made the bench, but unfortunately uh, they fell to Newcastle 4 0. And Taylor Booth, as well as Chris Richards, both started and played 90 minutes in Byron's U19's 0 uh, 0 draw over the weekend. And uh, some uh, exciting news. Uh, we want to congratulate one of our uh, favorite uh, players on the show, Matt Miazga, for getting married this past weekend. So uh, doing fantastic things uh, on the field as well as off the field. So congrats to Matt. Yeah, congrats, Matt. Woo. Apparently out of the blue, too. So that's uh, it's a baller move. That's awesome. And uh, Julian Green started, scored a goal, and also played all 90 minutes in Greuther first 1-1 draw with Erzgebirge Awa. 
That's great to hear, Austin. And uh, heading over to uh, League One in uh, England, uh, Lyndon Gooch was involved in a crucial uh, 1-0 uh, playoff game against Portsmouth. And he uh, started and played 70 minutes. So congrats to Lyndon. Hopefully they can uh, get back up to the championship. Yeah, that's big. It's uh, it's coming down to the end for them. So, uh, yeah. And uh, Richie Ledesma played in PSV U19's 1-1 uh, draw over the weekend. It's awesome. And... Uh, uh, heading over to Argentina, where uh, Matko Milhejevic uh, actually uh, st got his first start, Austin, for Argentinos uh, Juniors in uh, their Copa de uh, la Superliga match and a 0-0 draw against uh, Gymnasia, and he played 46 minutes. And as always, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel down below. And also, guys, you don't want to miss a single thing right now on our social media pages. We have uh, Instagram and Twitter, and uh, Austin wants to share some exciting things going on right now. That's right. So at the moment, we're putting out a uh, top 20 U20 eligible American players list. So basically a list ranking all of the top 20 eligible players, whether they're on the U20 World Cup roster or not, um, you know, just to show you know how much depth of talent and quality we have. So... Um, give it a give it a follow. You know, give some of our posts a like, and um, you know, retweet if you're on Twitter. Um, you know, we put some time and effort into it, so we appreciate you know any feedback you have for us, and you know, hopefully you guys agree with the list too. So, and, uh, Austin, speaking of all that that depth and quality of talent, uh, especially with this U20 uh, group here, I think uh, you know something exciting is going to happen for the start of the summer that uh, we'll all be celebrating about throughout the uh, the year here. <laughs> That's right. If you speak it into existence you know that's that's how you do it you speak it and it comes it happens so that would be we will win the 2019 u20 world cup